Hallelujah, Lord, we're so thankful for your presence today. Thank you for breaking every fetter and setting the yoke free from us. And thank you, Lord, continue now as we look into your word to break those bondages and hindrance that we may be free indeed because those you've set free are free indeed. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name and all the saints said amen. amen. And God bless you. Please be seated. And let's just see what the Lord would say this morning as we look into his word. I'm thankful to be here. I hope you're thankful to be here. We've had a little bit of change in time and a little change in the weather. So with both changes, you've been able to make it here. And I bless you with and congratulate you and those that are tuning in. They couldn't make it this morning. We're so glad to have you on the Internet. And we hope you will listen as the Lord will speak through this vessel and believe that God will say something to you. Well, we know that there is a story in the Luke 15 about two brothers and a father. And it's a journey that they were on, and there are many applications to this story that Jesus told us. And the one of them has to do with the son. We call him the prodigal son because, you see, he had an itch that he couldn't scratch. And he had to go somewhere to find somebody that would scratch that itch. But it, well, he had to leave home, so he went in seeking to find something that would satisfy him. So often we look into the world to see what this will satisfy us when what we got right at home is the right thing, but it's what we need. And so he went into the world, you know the story, and there he allowed himself to go through what we believe was a great deal of money. Because we know that his father was wealthy and he demanded, he said, Lord, Father, I want my inheritance. And he gave him his inheritance. And I'm sure he instructed him, but I'm sure it went over hardened ears that he didn't hear what his father was saying. But he came to that place where most of us do, where you want out of your own resources. Anybody been there? All right. You know that, that it was no longer working, and he ended up in certainly the very worst circumstances that a Jewish boy could end up in, and that's living with the hogs in the pig pen itself. And he said he was so hungry that he wishes he could eat of the pods that the pigs were eating. But he repented, and he came to his father. You know the story. And he said, Father, forgive me, for I want to be back in the family. I don't need a position. I want a job. I just want a place that I can work and be productive and fruitful. But we know the other part of the story, and oftentimes is presented this way as the benevolent father, generous and gracious as he was, representing our heavenly father, and ran to meet him and to greet him and to embrace him and to put the robe on his back and the, and the ring on his finger and bring him back into the family and say, Welcome home, son. I am so excited. What a joy that must have been to this prodigal son to come back not knowing exactly how he was going to be received when he got home. But as God has always been so benevolent, so merciful, that he meets us and greets us and welcomes us back into the fellowship with him. So it was with that son, with the father. And he, we got a picture of the repentant son and the benevolent, gracious father. But we have another picture there that Jesus wanted us to, to not miss. And that was the picture or the story of the other son. You see, he was busy in the field when his brother came home. And you see, he was already there protecting his inheritance. That's why he was working in the field. He didn't want to lose anything. Because you see, he had a very strong spirit of poverty on him, even though he was a wealthy man. Yes, and so he, he began to be, just become more and more angry. And his father said, Rejoice because your brother is home and he's come back and we're having the fatted calf is being uh, slaughtered and prepared. Don't you hear the rejoicing of the servants? Oh, everyone's excited. But the son says, I don't know how you could do that. 
That was, he was uh, unrepentant, went out and spent his money on prostitutes and did things. And I have always been here, the obedient one. I've always done everything you asked me to do. And I've been the type of compliant child that has honored you. But the father says, yeah, but you've already gotten your inheritance. Everything I have is yours. There's no need for resentment. There's no need for your being this way. And what it was, he had a root problem, you see, and his root problem was envy. Envy. So we looking at this, we see that he never did repent, the brother that we know of, and he continued in that state of mind. You come, because, you see, the root problem when it's envy it's a growing problem. I call it sin seed because it has no limit. It takes root in your spirit or it takes root rather in your soul and begins to grow there. You see, envy cannot be satisfied. or too great. It'll go to great lengths and it'll go to all kinds of depths. And, and we see this. It began early in the church. We In the history of the church, or the history of the Bible, I should say, we go all the way back to Adam and Eve, and they had two sons, right? Cain and Abel. We know that they were both brothers, and as far as we know, they grew up in a very protected environment. But Cain was one that, he was the one that had harvested from the soil. He grew the plants. He grew the harvest. His brother Abel was the one who managed the flocks. And it was a requirement that they both bring a first fruits to the father. Now, we assume that they would do that from each of their harvests. Now, some people would interpret that and tell you that it was because Cain and Abel, it was because Cain did not bring a blood offering. But I believe that it tells us that he didn't bring the best of his fruits. That what he bought, brought was the fruits of, the, of, the, of his harvest that he didn't want. That's what Malachi says. You've robbed me because you brought your one-eyed and one-legged animals and, and slaughtered them and called that worship. And the Lord says that is not satisfying if you don't give your best. Wake, well, we need to wake up church sometime and be remember that. And so it was that Cain and Abel, they became such envy in Cain that he slew Abel, killed his own brother, because you see, he envied him. And so we see that envy is a very serious sin. Now don't you get quiet on me just because I said that. <laughs> you keep listening, will you? Because I really feel like I'm coming to a reason why we're doing this. You see, if you do not have, if, if you, let me help myself. <laughs> and then Cain came to the Lord and he said, why are you, or the Lord looked at him and said, Cain, why are you so downcast? Your head's hanging low. You got a whole lot of shame. What's the problem? He didn't say you got a whole lot of shame. I said that. Because <laughs> I know what it is to have shame. Anybody else in here want to tell me they know what it is to have shame in your life? Wishing you hadn't have done something. Wishing you hadn't have said something. Wish I could go back and change it. But he couldn't. So he says, why are you so downcast? And he says, if you do, listen church, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door, listen, to have you and you must master it. I want to say that again because, you see, that's a whole simple sermon right there. That's everything we would need. When the Lord spoke to him, he says, if you do not do what is right or if you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if you don't do what is right, you will be accepted up in sin. Why? Because it's crouching at the door. Sin is waiting on you. Sin is constantly aware of where you are and you can't go in and out of that door without passing through the sin. And so you need to be careful to remember that if you do what's right, the door is open. If you don't do what's right, he's crouching at the door. 
So we begin to see. Now, I have said all of us have a propensity for this, for this sin. And the reason I say that, because it's a part of life. All of us have a tendency to think about what is right and what's just. And we always say it this way. When you look back on the Bible and you see the book of Job, you wonder, what in the world did Job do? Now, the faith people have taught us, they, they say, it's because he had fear instead of faith. And he said, that which I feared most has come upon me. And that may have been his root issue. But I do know that when we look at it, my point is, there is a place there we wonder why it was that way. But I want to say it, we've all said this, good things happen to bad people. <laughs> and bad things happen to good people. We've all said that. I don't understand why good things happen to people who don't deserve it. I don't understand how in the world that could happen to that person when I've done so well. I, have a, I had a job. I've worked hard. I've done everything that's been told to me, and they got an advancement over me. I've brought up my children the best way I can. I've taught them everything, took them to church, taught them the Bible and everything, and yet they have gone astray. I don't understand how that could happen. Relationships break down. We were so in love when we got married. I don't know what happened. What went astray? But good things happen to bad people and bad things to good people. In Psalm 73, it talks about there, this is the psalmist is saying, and he is saying there he starts off. It's interesting because in the first verse, he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Now, he's got a big complaint, but he's already resolved it. And he's already come to the conclusion that God is good. He says, truly God is good to Israel. Oh, he's so good so, to such as are pure in heart. How did he get there? Let's look at a little bit just scanning through. He said, for I was envious. Say envious. You got it. I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Oh, he was having a hard time. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Mm, they're billionaires. They speak loftily. He goes on to say, they increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. Now, now does he no longer is complaining, he's now a victim. He's become a victim out of this. He, you see, let me, let me tell you, emotion is the root of envy. Or envy is started by emotion. But listen to these. Now he's a victim before he says, they, they increase in riches. Surely I've cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence all day long. I've been plagued and chastise every morning for I have said I will speak thus behold I will have I would have been untrue to the generation of your children when I thought how when I thought how to understand this it was too painful for me boy he's at the bottom he's gotten low he's down there now with the pigs in the pig pen He's thinking, I'm a victim. But then he said, listen to what he says in verse there. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. You see, when I got into the presence of the Lord, I understand that he's looking for me. He will deal with those situations in his time and in his way, and that is not my responsibility. What I know is I'm going to spend eternity with God. What I know, he and I are in fellowship one with another. What I know is I have his anointing and his promises. I have his authority. I walk in all of these things that he's given me, but I forget about that until I get into his presence. Now he says, now I know. I've been in the sanctuary. Listen, when you've been in the presence of the Lord like this morning and you've been set free, and don't you go back and get back into bondage. Don't you let the enemy pull you back into bondage. You say, I'm free. I'm going to stay free. I've been in the sanctuary. I've been in the presence of the Lord. I felt his power. I've known that's his power. And I'm just as excited as I can be. I don't know about all that other stuff. 
but I will not be a victim. Hey, come on, church. Say, I will not be a victim. Say, I am not a victim. Amen. But you see, envy had taken him to that place. As he started looking out there what others had and what he didn't have, he began, his emotions began to grow and he began to say, this is not right. This is not fair. I'm, God's blessing them. They're prosperous. They're well. They got good children. They behave well. They don't act out. I mean, come on. I don't know what. What have I got to do, Lord? Now, you don't have any children like that. but I, <laughs> You see, the origin is emotion. And it can start with as little as discontent. You can start just a little discontent, just a little victimized, just a little unhappy. And it begins to grow because when you don't deal with it at that level, it becomes bitterness. And then it becomes a victimhood. And then it says in the Bible that it brings confusion. You see, the, psalm, the psalmist was confused. He had forgotten, and therefore he was in confusion. It brings anger. And you know, when all of this happens, it results in self-hate. You know why? Because how many of us so many times have said, like I, like I said, they get in, we get into that place where we think, why did I do that? What did? What was I thinking? Why? Why did that happen? Why did I do it? And then out of that place, you begin to think, I'm not worthy. I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm just a low down, no cast down, no good. Nothing is good in me. And then you begin to pile that negativism on yourself. And after a while, you forget who you are in Christ, because it started with a little seed, sin seed of envy. And so we, we look at this. It's, envy is a painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another joined with a desire to possess the same advantage. We've heard the expression, you green with envy, see? That means you keep looking until you turn green. <laughs> I'm looking to see who's green. But you get my point is you got an advantage. I like your advantage. I envy you for having that advantage, and I want it. That's envy. That's possessiveness. Well, I want to say to you that envy is a serious sin. Can I get agreement on that? Well, I want to, I want to keep on like that. You know how serious it is. If you have a Catholic background, it's one of the seven deadly sins. And so it's very serious. But the Bible speaks to it at great length. All the way through the Bible, it talks about this. Matter of fact, we can go all the way back to Lucifer, can't we? Here, here he was, the, the praise leader, the one that we believe led the praise and the worship. And he obviously had great influence with the angels to that place that he envied God. He envied God was that he had to worship God instead of the angels worshiping him. He said, I want to be the one to be worshipped. And so out of that, God had to kick him out. Remember that sometimes you have to fire some of your people. And I did not say praise and worship leader. I did not say that. I, I'm just talking about business. I better stop and go on to the next verse. Proverbs 14.30. Let's look at how it is. A sound heart is, is life to the body, but envy is what? rottenness to the bone. That's serious stuff. Ooh, I got the picture. Okay, let's go on then. Let's look at that Romans 1 and let's go to 29 and 32 and hear what, a, what is uh, Paul saying in this first chapter of Romans as he's talking about justification. But he said, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetedness, maliciousness, full of what? Envy. Now we're talking about what kills. I mean, it's being put in the category of murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, woo, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things 
are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice it. Why did they have to put that sentence in there? I mean, it was bad enough, but it, now he's saying that by association, you approve of it, you're part of all of that. I think there's confusion. How about you? I mean, we're approving stuff or not approving it. We, we, we don't know exactly what to do, but sometimes even our own government's gotten confused, and it forgets to read that verse, and it doesn't know what that verse says is a word from God. So it's just by association. Envy is right up there with all of the sin, the others. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4. We know that 1 Corinthians 11 is the Lord's table, and there we come to him, and we remember who he is, and then we get to 12, and we talk about these great and wonderful uh, power, uh, miracles that God gives us. We call them the, the uh, gifts. And then we get over into 13, well, over into 14, it talks about prophecy, and it talks about speaking in tongues. And here we come back to 13, and it's, we call that the love chapter. See, love's right between miracles, right? Love's right between the gifts. And we have to have the right motivation for whatever we do. But it talks about the wonderfulness of love, what it has, the power of love. But it goes on to say, even if you cast out demons, if even if you have more faith that speak to mountains and watch them go, even if you do miracles and you do all of these things, in the name of Jesus, if you do them without love, there's sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. It goes on and says, love suffers long and is what kind? Love does what? Does not envy. Because you see, love and envy are, not, are opposites. They're opposite emotions. And so we begin, I'm trying to paint you a big picture here. In James 3, now James always speaks directly. He never holds back. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every, ooh, everything are there. For where envy exists, confusion exists, and every evil thing. So you see, it's a segue, it's an entrance, it's at the door, and it's waiting and crouching for us, and just waiting if you use envy, because you see if the enemy can use envy, he can plant that seed, and it won't be too long until you self-depreciate and don't understand the power of that sin. Well, I can tell the way you're looking at me, well, I don't envy. Well, maybe you don't. But you listen anyway. Well, let's talk about what are the consequences. It's a tool of the enemy. We, we know that every evil thing probably has a root in this enviness. And we go back and we look. And I've already spoken about Cain and Abel, that there was an envy root that caused that to take place. And I go look at Sarah and, and uh, Hagar, and, and what do I see there? But envy between them, because Sarah was promised a, a, an offspring, and she, like we often do, got ahead of God and wanted to be sure she brought God's promises to be. God promised it, therefore he hadn't finished, I'll help him. So we know what happens. We gave Abraham her, her servant, and Abraham goes in and has a child, Ishmael. And, and Ishmael, and now she starts having envy because it seems like what she thought would be her child is recognized as Hagar's child, and now there's envy there. And out of that, there's great resentment, and finally she has Abraham send him off into the wilderness and we've been having war ever since. We've never, it's still having war in the Middle East over that one situation. But you see, it was envy that separated it and drew it off. Well, what about, uh, we go on a little further and we see Isaac and the Philistines and we, and, and Abimelech, there he goes into the land of Egypt and Abimelech and, and he looks on his wife and he did the same mistake, made the same sin error at, that his father Abraham did and, and, and has to be protected again by God. But he goes over and he said, now let me tell you something, don't you go back over there in Egypt. I'll take care of you here. But we we're having a famine. This is a famine going on. How in the world are we going to take care of ourselves? He said, go dig a well. But the wells, they cover them up. Go dig them again. 
dig them up, and he finally hits that right well, and it flourishes. And, and there the Abimelech has great envy over Isaac, and he was jealous over Isaac, and that was the purpose. But had he gone into Egypt and tried to solve that problem, it would have, he would have ended up being the one that was envious. I could go on and on. Joseph and his brothers, there was envy. They envied Joseph because of the, the great dream. He wore the coat of multicolors. He was his father's favorite son. He was the baby. He was spoiled. And they didn't like it, and the other brothers resented it. You see, they had what? Envy in their hearts. And so we begin. I could go on and on. Rachel and Leah, look at them. I mean, there it was. Jacob loved Rachel, but he couldn't have Rachel until he had Leah. The father-in-law tricked him. We know that one. And so once he got to that place, but Leah seemed to be a, a baby machine. She could turn them out. And Rachel couldn't do anything. I mean, there was, Rachel was begging for a child, and she began to resent Leah. And what did she do? The same thing. She gave him her mistress or her servant. He had a child. Through the servant. And then she envied that. She was eaten up with envy. And it was destroying everything. And so we could go on. I could say again, all of, all of these are many, many examples of it. Uh, Miriam. I, mean, I thought about the Miriam. And you remember that Miriam and, and, and Moses and, and Aaron. Well, I can hear the conversation right now, can't you? Miriam says to Moab, oh, you'd have never made it if it hadn't been for me. I'm the one that put you in the creek. I'm the one that carried you down the river. I'm the one that took care of you. I was your nursemaid. I was the one that brought you through. I stood by you when all the other were, were abandoning you. I stood by you, and with all the people who came against you, I've stood strong. I think I ought to be right up there where you are. I'm, I'm really qualified, you know. I know God just like you do. I worship God just like you do. We both wear the same dress. <laughs> he, she envied him. And you know what happened? God had to deal with it. And he did, dealt with it severely. Gave her leprosy. And he sh slowed down the whole movement until she got her healing. And had it not been for Moses interceding, she probably wouldn't have gotten her healing. Envy, bad thing. Goes on and on. And then Saul and David, look at there. But I, every time I think of Saul and, 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 and David and how David was so wonderful to Saul and tried to have a relationship and didn't, but, but the people picked up an, uh, an offense against Saul in admiration for David and said, Oh, David's killed his thousand, Saul only his... 10,000 Saul on his thigh tried to kill him because he envied him. He envied him. He didn't intend to do that. He brought him in like a son to begin with, but he allowed envy to go forth until it became a, where he wanted to murder him. But I always remember Jonathan. You remember Jonathan? He did not envy David. He was the rightful heir to be the king. But God has shown him that, no, you're not to be the king. David's going to be the king. He's the warrior that I need now. Don't, get, don't be fooled. Jonathan was no wimp. He was a powerful man. He and his servant went out and whipped a whole bunch of them. I mean, just the two of them. I mean, he wasn't afraid. He went to battle. And he was also loyal to his father Saul. Because he didn't have envy. And I, I'm reminded also of the Jews and Jesus and how the, how the Jews, I mean the Pharisees, how they envied Jesus. It said they envied him. And you remember John the Baptist and his, his group? They all said, John, Jesus is getting more people than us. His crowd's growing and ours is diminishing. What are we going to do? And not only that, John, the, they go through the cornfield on the Sabbath and pick corn and eat it, and you won't even let us do anything. We just accept, wash our hands. That's all you'll let us do. We can't eat. We can't do anything on the Sabbath. And what did John say? John the Baptist, he was not envied. He said, he must increase, and I must decrease. You see, he understood the dynamics of what God was doing, and how wonderful. Well, I could go on in Haman and and, and uh, Mordecai. Haman resented Mordecai because Mordecai was not 
He was not humiliated by Haman. He was not, uh, he was not afraid of him. And so he just stood up to him, and yet he resented him, resented him, resented him until he brought him to a place where he thought he was about to annihilate him. You know, it's a beautiful irony, irony of God that he built a, a place to kill him, and he ended up hanging himself. Haman hung. That's the way that was. <laughs> so, but you get my point. I want to bring it home. I, I, I've got a reason for this. And, and envy versus jealousy. I know you're afraid I'm going to step on them. You're probably right. Now, they're a little bit different. And the reason I say that, because in, in Exodus 20 and 5, it says there that God, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. This is where we get our scripture for generational curses. It's from the fact that God will bring judgment on multiple generations. But you see, there's a little difference between jealousy and a lot of times they're used the same. We, we would say somebody is saying, oh, I see that dress you're wearing, I'm just envious of you. And we would say that as a compliment or mean it that way. Now you probably won't say that anymore. <laughs> but, but you get my point. I'm just jealous of the way you look th today or something that fact, but meaning it in the wrong way. But jealousy is, is almost like the word zealous. Jealous and zealous. When you're jealous, you're protecting, protective over something that you value and want to protect it and take care of it. When you're envious, you want what they have and you want it to become yours. You see, if somebody says something flirtatious to your to your wife or, or spouse, or I said wife because I'm I know spouse, but anyway, you get the point. You you you're not envious of them. You're jealous of your wife or your husband. You're protecting them. It's a protective. God says, I'm protective over Israel. I'm the one that wants to take care of them. I don't envy Israel. I'm just jealous over them. I'm jealous over their well-being. I want to protect them. And so there's a little difference there. But um, so it, it's a more of a, remember, an emotion. It's a different emotion. Jealousy is one emotion, and envy is another emotion. Well, I got a reason I'm doing this. I got a spiritual 911. I got an alert. Put up alert. We got alert. And the 911 alert is this a warning. This Tuesday, God woke me up and he said, There is a spirit of envy in this country. And I don't want the Life Center people to pick it up. I, were, I wondered about that. I said, Bless you, Ted. I, I wondered about that because I said, God, what, what, what do you, what do you want me to do with that? How do I, how do I work that one in, so to speak? And He says, I want you to bring it to the attention of the body at the life center, so they will not be caught up in the spirit of envy because it has been let loose. It is, a, it is a strategy of the enemy to uh, cause us to pick up envy. It's a spirit of envy that is out there operating, a spirit world at all levels. It, and in all the three areas of heaven, the highest and middle and lowest level, it's coming out of the highest and it's trying to cover us up. And only and even in the high places, look at our own nation today. It's filled with envy. There's backbiting and fighting and gossiping and all of that. And that is part of the spirit that's out there. And he's saying, don't get caught up in that. That is the spirit of the enemy. That is not of me. That is not my work. So be careful what you do. There's a warfare that goes on. It's going on everywhere right now. And, and you know, it's an amazing thing, but there are people that really want the President of the United States and the Senate and Congress to fail. They really want them to fail. We're it. We get the results of their failure. If we don't pray them in and pray them through and bring them to a, a godliness, what can we benefit out of that? The envy fruit will destroy all of us if we don't deal with the envy fruit. The 
it's not our, we cannot make those judgments. We can only judge based upon the will of God and say, please, God, bring them under your will, bring them under your subjection. But it's prevalent, it's pervasive, and we've got to be ready for it. It's at all levels in Ephesians 6 and 12. Let's look at that. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's not people. It's not people. It's spirits that we're dealing with in high places. It's, the, it's what we're talking about, demonic forces. So what do you do? You don't pick them up. If you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. And you are and waiting to have you, but you must what? Master it. So we can't pick up those offenses. We can't pick up those things that is pervasively happening in the world today. We can't do it. That's not ours. Listen, how do you do that? Let me tell you what I have a saying and it works. Don't try to fight the enemy on his turf. Make him fight you on your turf. Because if you go over there and get into backbiting, gossiping, critical spirits, you're going to end up fighting him on your, his turf, and he's going to have you for lunch. Make him come to you where you have the power, you have the authority. You can proclaim, you can, declare, you can declare, you can break holes, you can stand in the gap. You can bring the spiritual uh, power of God through your authority to bear. So don't, break, don't fight him on his turf, fight him on your turf. Don't give the accuser any territory. Don't, don't get caught up in the envy game. Well, how do you war? You stay in readiness. That's how you do it. You stay ready. Use 1st, 2nd Corinthians 10, 3, and 5. What does it tell you there? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not uh, war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. Go on the next verse, casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of of God bringing every thought, woo, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So now we're talking about a spirit that's out there. Well, how, what else do we do? We armor up. We like that scripture, don't we? Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Come on, give me um, Ephesians 6, 10, and 11. Finally, my brother, and be strong in the Lord and the power of is mine. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We know what they are. He put on the blessed prayer of righteousness, the sword of, of the power of God, of the word of God, the peace on your feet and breast and your gird your loins with truth. All of that. We soldier up. We get ready for the warfare because I'm telling you, you're going to be attacked. People are going to whisper in your ears and try to get you to pick up envy. Come on, put your head on your ears. Say, I will not hear the devil when he whispers in my ear. Now, come on, protect those ears. These are the ears that the Lord gave you, but your spiritual ears is what I'm talking about. Well, it's not about people. Over the years as pastor, I've been blamed for about everything you can be blamed for. I've been blamed for people going broke. I've been blamed for people can't sleep. I was even blamed blamed by one couple for impotence, and I'm, I don't know how they did that. I, I've been, I, you know, I, I've been blamed for financial loss. I've been blamed for not caring, not looking at you at the right time, all of that, you know, but I'm not your problem. I pray for us. I, I pray to protect us. I pray that the enemy will go and will have to leave and that this flock will grow up and be mature and be people that God can bring and use and be mighty warriors and bring down strongholds and destroy the devil and put him on his way. Come on, you're not a wimp. You're strong. You're strong. You're strong in the Lord. 
So it's not flesh and blood. So we want to know that uh, this morning, I want us to, do you get the message? You got that message. Do you understand that 911 alert is, it's a pervasive spirit that the, that the enemy is trying to use to capture us, to stop us, to make us stop when we will take authority. So I want to minister with you for just a minute. Will you stand to your feet? It's called activation. We believe in activation. First, I want to pray for every stronghold and every spirit of envy to be broken. And then we're going to go from there. Okay, then I'm going to activate you. Father, we thank you today for the power of the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the overcoming power of that, that Jesus demonstrated when he defeated the enemy and held him up and to, be an, and to be a demonstration of his power and his glory. We declare today, Father, that we will not be taken up with envy. We will not have strife in our life that are bad, the emotions that lead to envy. We thank you, Lord, for letting us be forearmed by forewarning us. We thank you today, Lord, that the work of the Holy Spirit is greater than, than the work of the enemy because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We thank you today, Lord, that what you've begun, a good work, you will complete it. We thank you today that you have power and broken the envy because they envied you, Jesus, and you broke the power of the devil when you broke that power of envy. So in the name of Jesus today, we declare that power of envy, jealousy, whatever it may be, is broken now in Jesus' name. We pull down every stronghold. We declare that every stronghold that was broken during praise and worship and after will stay broken in the name of Jesus. And we declare that the enemy shall not prevail. The enemy will have no victory through us or over us because we declare as it has been praised to you today we are free we thank you lord for setting us free now lord let us stay free let us not walk through the door where sin crouches but to continue to walk through the door of liberty and righteousness and we thank you for the finished work of christ on the cross and we thank you for his work in jesus name now i want you to do this i want to I want you, first of all, I want to say, say this. I want you to repeat with me, if you will. Father, Father right, now, right now, I thank you, I thank you for breaking the power of envy. The power of envy. And, any sin, and any sin that may have resulted from it. I pray, Lord, you'll cleanse my heart. Renew my mind. Empower me with the truth. And keep me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want you to get a partner. We're going to activate you right here. Don't know exactly. Just it doesn't matter if it's your best friend or husband or wife. It's, it's just a partner. That's right. Hold hands with somebody. Don't be afraid to hold hands for a minute. You ready? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to declare over each other this power that I prayed over you. I need a somebody. Everybody got to have a somebody. Find a somebody. If you don't have a somebody, raise your hand. There's one over here. Come here, sweetie. You got it? Okay. How are we going to do this together? Okay. You don't have to wait one for the other. We're going to both you do what I, I'm going to instruct you. Okay? Here we go. Father, Father I, speak I speak over my friend, over my friend this, other this other believer, that they will stay free. They will have no envy. They will have no strife. And they will have the abundant life. And I pray favor, release, goodness, kindness, all the fruit of the Spirit over, my, over this beloved one. And I do it now in the name of Jesus. All right, there you did it. You did something and you 